Hi, welcome to this special hour-long edition of Controller's Corner. I'm your host, Pat Curry, joined as always by Buffalo Controller Mark Schroeder. A little bit later, we're going to have an interview with Voice of the Buffalo Bills, John Murphy. But first, our top story. In an effort to boost the city's bond ratings, Controller Schroeder took analysts from Fitch on a tour of the city's economic rebirth. Now, Mark, City's got an A plus rating with Fitch ratings. Right. They're one yeah. of the three major rating agencies. Correct. Standard and Poor's and Moody's are the right. other two. Right. You took them on a tour of Buffalo. Yeah. And Buffalo got upgrades from those two organizations. Yeah. Now, Fitch already had Buffalo at the A plus category, but you're hoping showing them in person this economic progress is going to bolster the city's rating and possibly provide an upgrade in the future. Yeah, no, no question about it, Patrick. And so we did this some time ago and we brought in Moody's and Standard & Poor's as you suggested. And then uh, we invited Fitch and they came here recently and they were very impressed with Buffalo. And these are analysts who usually are more interested in the numbers. But because they know we're on a post-industrial Buffalo opportunity right now, they kind of wanted to see for themselves. And we've aligned ourselves with great partners to take them around and give them a tour uh, of the city of Buffalo, which, which you will uh, talk about uh, a little bit later. But for now, I, I just wanted to let the citizens know that we brought them to see the mayor. And the mayor talked to them about some things that ordinarily wouldn't be on the tour. And that is public safety things, crime uh, situations in the city of Buffalo and how uh, the mayor and his administration is trying to, uh, you know, do a good job to keep that down. And so these are, these are certain things um, that when you bring in the rating agencies, uh, you, you have to make sure that they're talking to the right people uh, so that they can then form the opinion uh, that would lead us to another upgrade coming down the road. So it was, yeah, it, it was very, very successful. And I just want to thank all of our partners across the city who showed Fitch uh, a really um, wonderful view of what Buffalo looks like now. Now, one of the reasons you wanted to bring them in and show them in person is because you've talked to them on the phone many times. You met with them in New York City. But until you see the progress that Buffalo is experiencing, it's hard to put it into words. Yeah. That's what we were thinking on this show. Rather than just tell the viewers about this tour that we took Fitch on, we, we have a special report that's going to show them exactly what Fitch saw on their tour of Buffalo. Stay tuned for this Controller's Corner special report on the economic projects that are reshaping Buffalo. Hi, welcome to this Controller's Corner special report on the economic development projects that are reshaping the city of Buffalo. We're going to be taking you to the Buffalo Niagara Medical Campus and the solar panel manufacturing facility at Riverbend in just a few minutes. But first, let's explore the progress Buffalo has been making on developing its waterfront. And where better to do that than right here at Canal Side? Whether it's paddle boating on the historic canals in the summertime or ice skating on them in the winter, Canal Side has become a year-round destination that embraces Buffalo's history as the western terminus of the Erie Canal. One of the best places to enjoy Buffalo's waterfront is on the water itself. So let's go aboard one of the tour boats of Captain Rick Hilleman. I'm aboard the Spirit of Buffalo with Captain Rick Hilleman. Now Rick, in addition to this great schooner, you're also the captain of the Buffalo River History Tours and the Queen City Bike Ferry. What can passengers expect aboard one of your boats? Well, the Queen City Bike Ferry completely blew us away with our passenger count. Originally, when we launched it, we expected about 10,000 riders going across the Buffalo, uh, the Buffalo Harbor um, for the entire season. Well, a little more than three weeks into it, we, uh, we already hit the 10,000 mark, and now we're looking at a possibility of moving uh, 50,000 people for the entire season from the inner to the outer harbor. Uh, it's been a huge success. The, uh, the Buffalo River History Tours, we started that four years ago, and uh, that's increasing uh, every day, and uh, telling the story of the city of Buffalo, what we're all about, how we began, and uh, the history of the Erie Canal, all of the grain elevators up the Buffalo River, so that's a huge success with us, uh, and we plan on having that uh, continue. The Spirit of Buffalo, uh, we started the Spirit of Buffalo, brought it up from Georgetown, South Carolina in 2009, the spring of 2009. 
when Canal Side was really just starting to get going. And uh, at that time, you can uh, probably shoot a uh, cannon down the boardwalk after 5 o'clock and not hit anybody. And, uh, and now you can see how vibrant it is down here. The City of Buffalo and Erie Canal Harbor Development Corp. Has, uh, has done a great job, and I think uh, we're a world-class city here, coming close to it. Now you navigate Lake Erie, Buffalo River. We're in the Erie Canal right now. The Niagara River is close by. How have these waterways forged Buffalo's history over the past two centuries? Well, it's, uh, starting off with Lake Erie, Lake Erie in the uh, early days of uh, shipping, the uh, opportunity to ship grain across the uh, Great Lakes into the Buffalo Harbor and transfer them to canal boats, that was a, uh, a huge part of uh, what we are today. And it was all about the uh, all about the grain industry is what started Buffalo and the Erie Canal. So the uh, the Niagara River, of course, the uh, the power plant. Uh, that, uh, that we have uh, down in Niagara Falls. This is all uh, huge to Buffalo. Uh, we were the first city in the, uh, in the United States to have street lights. So uh, that was pretty exciting for us, and that was all due to Niagara Falls. The, uh, the Buffalo River just shaped our, uh, shaped our, uh, our history and our future uh, with the grain industry becoming the largest grain port in the world at one time. So all of these waterways uh, that are right next to us just shaped this city the way it is today. Now, in addition to Canal Side, we're seeing other pop parks popping up on the shores of Lake Erie and the Outer Harbor and in the Buffalo River. Is Buffalo regaining its status as a waterfront city? Oh, absolutely. I believe that um, wholeheartedly. The, uh, every year that we've been here, we see something new coming along. You know, as, as you mentioned, the parks, you know, Wilkeson Point and uh, the rest of the parks in the Outer Harbor. <clears throat> we have... Um, we have River, Seth, River Fest Park and uh, uh, all of the other things that are happening up here along the Buffalo River. We're seeing developments now up the Buffalo River, such as River Works and, uh, and uh, River Fest Park, the new building that's going up there as a banquet hall, a hot dog stand, and just many things going on. The, uh, the Erie Freight House, for example, uh, that's all being redeveloped now to townhouses. So. We're looking forward to it. I see things coming almost uh, every day. Now, Rick, you were one of the first businesses to locate here at Canal Side. You mentioned how the crowds have really increased since uh, you first started. How else has it changed since you got your start here in 2009? Well, besides the crowds coming in, what we notice mostly is we, we start seeing people on our vessels from, uh, from all over the world. I mean, we have like... Uh, just different cultures coming in, people we've never seen before. Huge groups from, uh, from China, for example. Uh, a, a lot of uh, groups that we entertain on the Buffalo River telling our side of the story here. Also Toronto, we, uh, Toronto, Montreal. Last night we had a group of people from Montreal taking, uh, taking a ride on the Spirit of Buffalo. And uh, <clears throat> talked to one couple, it was uh, really exciting. They had a three-day vacation, they had a babysitter for three days. So uh, out of all the places they could pick, they lived in Montreal, they picked Buffalo to come and spend their three days. So That's great. Now we're seeing Canal Side spur private development, including the $200 million Harbor Center project that the Buffalo Sabres built, and they just hosted the NHL Scouting Combine last week. What else do you envision for the future of Canal Side, and what do you see coming to it in the years ahead? I think in the private sector, what I see is I see more retail space, um, shops, uh, shops, and more restaurants uh, downtown in the downtown area, Canal Side area. Uh, that's what I envision. Um, you know, when we look at uh, other cities such as Baltimore and places like that, and Boston, um, I think that's going to play a big part of uh, retaining the uh, the people that are coming in to visit Buffalo as a destination. So I think a few more of those type of things as, from the private sector I think is going to help us. Well, thanks for joining us in Controller's Corner, and thanks for your contributions to Buffalo's waterfront. We've seen where Buffalo likes to play. Now let's look at where it goes to work. I'm here at the Buffalo Niagara Medical Campus, where a new children's hospital and the University at Buffalo's new medical school are currently under construction. Once complete, these projects will join Roswell Park Cancer Institute and Buffalo General Hospital as the main anchors of the campus, and they'll employ more than 17,000 people. But the goal of putting all these entities into one place is to foster the collaboration and innovation that will lead to new startup companies. And the plan is working. More than 140 new companies have started here at the campus 
feeding off the synergy and brain power located here. Helping these startups succeed is the goal of Pat Whalen, a one-time entrepreneur who's now the chief operating officer of the medical campus. Pat, you work out of the Innovation Center. How does that building help young businesses start up and succeed? Well, I believe that entrepreneurs need a support system, and that's first and foremost what we try to do in that building. Uh, we're a little different than a lot of incubators because uh, most incubators assign mentors. What I believe in and what we believe in on the medical campus is that the, mentor, the mentorship comes from peer-to-peer -to -peer mentoring. So we designed the building in such a way as we designed the rest of the campus, really, uh, so that entrepreneurs bump into each other. We call them purposeful collisions. We try to have them bump into each other, and where they bump into each other, they can sit down. There's a whiteboard usually, and they can sketch their ideas out, and uh, two entrepreneurs may talk to each other and get an idea for another business. But uh, to support the businesses they already have, I think it's all about peer-to-peer -peer mentoring. So if the medical campus were a hospital, the Innovation Center would be the neonatal unit helping these young businesses start up. Right, yeah, and they need help. Uh, entrepreneurs need help. Everybody talks about money, of course. You need money, but it really starts before you need money. You need, you need a business plan. You need to build a team. You need, you need a lot of things, uh, actually, before you need money. And what we try to do is get them ready to ask for the money intelligently. And there's been over 140 companies that have already started here at the Innovation Center. Uh, on the campus, uh, not all of them at the Innovation Center. Most of them, I think there's 100 companies in the building now. Uh, there's a lot more that are uh, germinating really in DIG, which is uh, our pre-incubation space. Uh, but there's about 140 uh, startup companies on the campus and really that's happened in five years uh, since we opened the Innovation Center. At the time there were three companies on the campus, so uh, 140 companies from three is a pretty, pretty good success in five years. Now the Innovation Center and the campus as a whole is designed to foster these purposeful collisions. How is the rest of the campus designed to foster this kind of collaboration? Well, we're standing in Ellicott Park. So the city of Buffalo, uh, uh, Matt Ensis, really my boss, uh, way before I was here, uh, realized that the, the idea was all about purposeful collisions and collaboration. Uh, he went and campaigned uh, in Washington, got the federal government to, to uh, come up with some money to, to, to uh, develop this park here. Uh, that money flowed through the state DOT and the city of Buffalo and the city of Buffalo's team designed this park with us and uh, as you can see the the park is designed in such a way that it gets hopefully it gets people out of these buildings on the campus walking and where they pass each other there's benches in the park and since we can't put whiteboards in the park we're deploying sidewalk chalk so that the entrepreneurs or researchers can sketch out their ideas on the sidewalk take a picture of it with their phone and and uh, use that instead of a whiteboard. Buffalo controller Mark Schroeder recently took analysts from Fitch Ratings on a tour of Buffalo, and you led the part of the tour that dealt with the medical campus. What did you show these analysts? Well, we started where the research happens because uh, obviously the entrepreneurs are important, but I think that's the end game. Uh, obviously, the member institutions have other goals. Uh, Kaleida and Roswell are interested in great outcomes in clinical care. University of Buffalo is interested in research. Roswell is interested in research. Uh, University of Buffalo is interested in education. Uh, but out of that, all those people now that are, are reaching critical mass with all those people on the campus, that results in ideas and what we're trying to do at the Innovation Center is, is germinate those ideas in the companies. So what we did on the, on the tour is we started where the research happens and the education happens and the clinical care happens because without that, without Collider Roswell UB and our other uh, member institutions, we really don't have uh, the innovations. We don't have a need for the Innovation Center because the innovation is really coming from the researchers and the member institutions. So what I tried to do on the tour was show the Finch people the whole gamut. It starts with starts at the other end of the campus with research and education and clinical care, and then it works up its way up here to where we where we try to commercialize that research. Now, have any businesses outgrown the Innovation Center and branched out into the community? Yes, we've had uh, uh, a couple of graduates from our incubator in the Innovation Center. And uh, uh, it's interesting that a lot of times they outgrow the, the incubator and they want to stay. 
Uh, but if they're not in the life science space, uh, our job is really to grow those businesses and, and get them out to the private sector. So uh, we've had some grow, outgrow the incubator in the, in the innovation center and move down in the innovation center. So right across the street is uh, Mobile Healthcare Connections. They were our first tenant and uh, they occupy about 8,000 square feet of space on the first floor. They're in the life science business and they needed access to the clinicians and the research that happens on the campus, so they're still on the campus. But generally speaking, we're trying to grow the companies and get them out of here in the, in the private sector uh, with the private sector landlords and real estate developers. Now you mentioned DIG, the pre-incubator project. What does DIG stand for and is it just for medical companies or any type of entrepreneur? It stands for Design Innovation Garage. It's actually in the space that used to be the Trico test garages, where they tested windshield wipers. It is not for only uh, life science companies. In fact, in, in the Innovation Center, we have DIG, which is pre-incubation space. We have accelerators, two accelerators, uh, 43 North and Z80, and we have an incubator. And those four operations really are, are not just for life science companies. When you graduate and you need to sign a lease, and your your post incubation, then that's when we 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 don't want uh, non life science companies to stay here. We only want the life science companies to stay here. But we're trying to incubate all kinds of companies, and I think it's that's that's a very important point, because our estimation is, and there's a lot of research on this that shows the more eclectic, the more diverse the the group of people you have, the more innovation you get. So we're really we're actually trying to get all different kinds of companies in the pre-incubation space and the acceleration space and the incubation space because the more diverse that group is, the more uh, innovation we get. Now the innovation center has been so successful. You're looking at plans to expand the innovation center and possibly do other innovation centers on the campus, correct? Correct. We we're, we talk a lot about innovation center too. We've been working on that for quite a while. Uh, this building is full. We have developed two other uh, um, spaces on the campus. Uh, we call Innovation Center Annex uh, at Maine and Virginia. And we have a, a life science incubator at 73 High Street, the old Hauptman Woodward building. Uh, but all of it's full. We're all full. The, all, the, all the real estate we've developed for early stage companies is now full. So obviously there's a need uh, for more space. So that's, that's the reason we're working on Innovation Center 2. I'm not sure uh, what Innovation Center 2, what, what would that form would be. It could be for more mature companies and we still do all the incubation uh, here at the Innovation Center. I guess we still need to work some of those details out, but there's definitely, definitely a very definite need for more space on the campus for private sector companies. Now, 140 companies is an awfully good start to, for startups. What is a goal that you think is realistic in 10, 20 years from now for campus, uh, companies starting up at the campus? Uh, I wouldn't even want to guess. Uh, okay. If you would have, if I would have guessed, uh, if you would ask me this question five years ago, I don't think I would have guessed at 140. Mm -hmm. uh, we've done better than I would have ever imagined, and we've done it really without being a critical mass. We are, we're not a critical critical mass today. But when the med school is completed here in 2017, when the children's hospital is here in 2017, I believe we'll be a critical mass. We'll have another 5,500 people on the campus, bringing the total to 17 or 18,000 people, and that's an awful lot of brain power here. That's that, that we hopefully will have purposeful collisions between those people. They'll come up with ideas. Those ideas will become companies and. I, the sky's the limit. We could, we could, if we've done 140 companies without critical mass, uh, I think we could do hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of companies uh, here on the campus. Now, keep in mind, the last five years have been pretty good five years economically for for the United States in general. Uh, so I don't want to. Uh, we don't want to get too big ahead here. We've had we've had a started in 2008 when the economy was bottomed out, and it's been five good years. So. Uh, we haven't had a lot of failures in the new companies, and that's, that's unusual, and I don't think we can expect that kind of success indefinitely. At some point in time, there's going to be a hiccup in the economy, and we're going to have failures uh, more than we've had. But we've been very lucky and fortunate so far. We've got great entrepreneurs, and they get great coaching here. So I think, I think uh, we've laid a good, solid foundation. Now, you mentioned the medical school and the children's hospital being finished. What else is on the horizon for the campus, and where do you see it down the line? Well, I think uh, the big, the big advances on the campus in terms of real estate development probably um, centered around the University of Buffalo. 
I think uh, I think they would like to move uh, four more units down here. I think they'd like to see someday pharmacy. That's probably the last one, but dentistry, public health, nursing. I can't speak for the University of Buffalo though. Uh, I think that, but I think those would be big big additions and then obviously the private sector companies we have us you know just read that empire genomics is looking for a newer facility and they're raising 14 million dollars uh kinex is is doing well so we're going to have more of those successes and those successes are going to drive uh, more development of buildings innovation center two would be a good example we need to we need to find space for these companies we don't want them to leave so that's a really important thing for buffalo i think the growth of the medical campus is part of Buffalo's shift towards science and technology and away from the heavy industry that once dominated its economy. Nowhere is that shift more evident than right here. Once a sprawling steel plant, this site lay dormant for decades after the plant closed. Now under construction is Buffalo Riverbend, which will be the largest solar panel manufacturing facility in the Western Hemisphere. At 1.2 million square feet, this $6 billion project will create 3,000 permanent jobs. I'm speaking with Frank Simonelli, Vice President of General Contractor LP Simonelli, on the scale of this massive project. Now, Frank, what are the unique challenges of a project of this scale, especially one on such an accelerated timeline? Well, you hit the first one right on the head. It's the pace at which we're delivering this massive project, 1.2 million square feet in about in a little less than 18 months. Uh, beyond the, the, the sheer magnitude of the job and the speed, we have the uh, unusual nature of this being a brownfield reclaimed um, you know, steel fact factory and the surprises we, we find in the, in the ground, uh, coupled with you know, what I refer to as the speed of what industry wants and the fiduciary responsibility with state funds that, you know, that yin and yang uh, is also, you know, put some challenges on the staff. Now this plant will create 3,000 permanent jobs once it's open. How many construction jobs are resulting from this project? Right now there are about 450 tradespeople on site plus the about 50 people in the trail in our uh, trailer complex. Uh, at full peak we expect somewhere between 1,200 and 1,500 tradespeople to be on site. Now, can you put into perspective just the size of this project and a better understanding of what it compares to? Well, it's, it's 1.2 million square feet under roof. So to put that in perspective for somebody that really doesn't appreciate the magnitude of it, that's approximately eight uh, uh, Walmarts under, uh, under a single roof. Now, this was a former steel plant. What kind of evidence have you found of its previous use? Well, I jokingly say that every shovel is a new adventure out here because um, the process of uh, decommissioning a steel plant doesn't require them to pull out of anything that was underground uh, out of the ground. So the, the sheer mass of this plant, you know, the, the structures were everywhere. And so we uh, encounter old steel foundations, some scrap steel, building components, all kind of buried right under the ground. So we, we plan everything underground as if we're going to hit something. So we have a lot of pre-excavation, pre-drilling, so that we're doing everything um, in preparation for the actual work so that by the time the tradesmen that actually need to do the work come through here, they're, clean, they're, they're, they're working through virgin soil. We've already cleared the other stuff out of the way. Now, you mentioned a steel turbine that even your heaviest equipment had trouble lifting out. Yeah, the, uh, the, the excavators in the backgrounds are the, are the little ones. The big ones are gone now, but it took uh, quite, a, quite an effort just to scratch some of them out of the ground. Now this project includes a five billion dollar investment by Solar City, which is led by international business magnate Elon Musk. What makes Buffalo attractive to investors of his caliber? Well, I think what, not to speak for him, but from what, from my understanding, obviously the state's investment was a big piece of that. Uh, not to mention the uh, the local infrastructure, our, our proximity to major cities for transportation, and obviously skilled workforce. Uh, you know, is uh, are the th shots in the arm. Now this site is nestled in between several neighborhoods, uh, residential neighborhoods. What, an, what impact will this project have on those neighborhoods and as the economy as a whole? Well, we've already heard about um, some investment coming just down South Park for some of the um, support retail uh, restaurants already getting prepared for ultimately the 1,400 uh, employees that uh, will work at this plant. That, that hasn't been, you know, that's, uh, this plant's been dormant for 20 years. So obviously what the neighborhoods that used to support this facility uh, will, be, will be the initial benefactors uh, of, of that, that new use. Now we mentioned this accelerated timeline. When did you get started here and when are you going to finish up? 
Well, we, uh, we, I think groundbreaking was September 18th, and uh, that we started scratching out the, build, the initial building foot uh, based on the initial concept plans, and we went through a process where we were designing and constructing kind of in a just-in-time manufacturing type process. Where, uh, so we started in September, we, uh, we were pouring foundations through the winter, we started uh, steel erection in mid-February. Uh, as you can see, we're, we're nearing topping out and uh, we'll be enclosed before weather turns on us uh, and as it, as it plans right now we'll, we'll be receiving tools towards the end of this year beginning and next and we'll, they'll be receiving the manufacturing tools through the first and second quarter and then they do their commissioning, processing, kind of testing out before the plant comes into full production. Now that's quite an ambitious schedule for a project of this scale. Have you guys been working around the clock in an inclement weather to get this project done on time? Well, everybody knows how bad our winter in uh, particularly February was. So we, we right now, we're right on schedule uh, despite what Mother Nature did to us. So yeah, we did have, we lost about a week just uncovering from the snow in November and another couple of weeks just because of the cold weather in, in February. But ultimately, just from um, proactive planning and some long uh, six and seven day weeks, we've uh, been able to maintain the uh, desired outcome at, uh, with, the, with the delivery date. Great, thanks for joining us. Thank you. After struggling to adapt to economic conditions of the 20th century, Buffalo has rebounded in the new millennium. Realizing there were no silver bullets or quick fixes to the challenges it faced, Buffalo has adopted a multifaceted strategy to cultivating a more modern, sustainable economy. A new day has dawned in the city of good neighbors, one filled with optimism and enthusiasm for the future of Buffalo and its citizens. For Controller's Corner, I'm Pat Curry at City Hall. Yes, it certainly is a new day in our city. Now, Mark, you feel that Fitch left very impressed with what they saw in Buffalo and changed their views about what Buffalo is and what we're becoming. Yeah, no, no question about it. And as you said in the beginning of the show, Patrick, um, the, the highest rating we actually had was from Fitch. Um, you know, going, when I became the controller four years ago, we already had an A, uh, a plus from them. Um, but to bring them here now and to let them see all of the things that the viewers just saw and our citizens who are seeing it every day because they live here in Buffalo uh, was really a good thing for us. And they, they are, they're very, very impressed. Uh, and they know that this is just the beginning. And there are certain things that we've identified uh, you know, over the next three to five years that we have to do better. Uh, and we will continue to do that because Whenever we show progress uh, to ourselves uh, or to those who are looking, the rating agencies in particular, it's just going to help us in the long run. Now, the analysts from Fitch were recently quoted in the bond buyer. There was an article recently for the bond buyer that highlighted Buffalo. You were quoted extensively on it. Yeah. But also, the analysts from Fitch, Fitch Eric Friedman was quoted, and he said that Buffalo has modernized themselves very well and, and that the economic activity is notable. You know, he also mentioned, you took them on a tour, he also said in the article that Buffalo has a very professional staff, so that must be a validation of the tour that you took them on and the information you provided them over this process. Yeah, one, one of the things that we take great pride in is, uh, is the staff that we've assembled uh, in the controller's office. Uh, and then we also like to partner with those people who are very credible. And so analysts are used to asking a zillion questions. I will tell you, Patrick, uh, and you know you were on, you were on the tour, uh, they don't ask very many questions when you have the right people presenting to them. They become very good listeners. Uh, and then, you know, the bond buyer is a major, major publication. And we've kind of been under the radar screen with them uh, over the last three and a half years or so. For us to be mentioned in a very prominent way through the voice of a third party, an analyst from Fitch, 
<laughs> is just incredible. It's fabulous. And when I got done with the interview uh, with the bomb buyer, they wanted to make it clear that I'm always invited uh, to their studio in New York City. And anytime I'm there, uh, they will take the time uh, to listen to what's happening. And I would be able to give them a progress report uh, on what they now know. So all in all, it's just a, a tremendous uh, situation going on he here in Buffalo, but you have to be able to articulate it and communicate it, and that's what we've, we're doing uh, in the bond buyer and with our relationship with the rating agencies. Now, in addition to the three experts that we showcased on the special report, you also had Peg Overdorf from the Buffalo Riverfest Park in the waterfront portion, and Howard Zemsky from Empire State Development gave a brief rundown of the Buffalo Billion program, and, and they saw the Buffalo Billion in action at Riverbend. Yeah, uh, imagine that. I mean, Howard Zemsky uh, is the commissioner statewide for economic development in our state, including New York City and all of the cities across our state. And he's, he's from here, he's ours. And, and he always, no matter how busy he is, and no, no, how, it doesn't matter, the airplane after airplane he has to catch and go somewhere else, he always is here for us. And Peggy Overdorf, just recently in Business First, uh, was named one of the top 100 women uh, in Western New York. That tells you something about the people that we associate with and that we tell, have an opportunity to tell the story, the Buffalo story, uh, to those who need to hear it. So you just recently gave this tour to Fitch. The tour that you gave to Standard and Poor's and Moody's was two years ago. Now so much has happened in the past two years that you're thinking about getting Moody's and Standard and Poor's back to Buffalo to yeah, show yeah. them all the new projects. I, I'm not thinking about it. I'm doing it. We're going we're to bring them back. We need to and, uh, and we are going to be inviting them to come to Buffalo uh, whenever they choose to come. But the great thing about Buffalo now is that you know when, when we first did this a couple years ago we wanted to make sure we brought Moody's and Standard and Poor's in the summertime. Well guess what? I, it doesn't matter to me when they come. There are so many different winter activities and things going on in our neighborhoods, in downtown Buffalo, on the waterfront, 12 months out of the year. It doesn't matter. You pick your time when you want to come back to see Buffalo, and Buffalo will shine. No doubt about it. Now, one of the most important things about the economic progress that Buffalo has been making is that it reaches all citizens and not just the select few. Now, you just recently signed the mayor's Buffalo Opportunity Pledge, which is, supports diversity and inclusiveness yeah. in, in all s parts of city government and in the economic rebirth of the city and hoping that this opportunity that's out there is open to everyone and inclusive of everyone. Sure. So, so the, the mayor a few weeks ago invited all of the elected officials across Buffalo, Erie County, Western New York uh, to sign the Buffalo uh, Opportunity Pledge. And the pledge is very, very important and I'm certain that the citizens can look on our website and other websites to see what it means and what it says. There are five different whereases within the pledge. One of the most important whereases, in my view, is the first one, where it says, whereas diversity is an inclusive concept which encompasses race, color, ethnicity, gender, disability, sexual orientation, and identity, religion, nationality, and socio economic status of which we've been saying right from the beginning and in one of the publications that you'll talk about later uh, our PAFR, our award-winning PAFR on page 5 we talk about demographics or socioeconomics and it's extremely important and what I'm talking about citizens of Buffalo what I'm actually saying is that there are certain categories uh, that we're looking at that we have to do better. And uh, Council President Darius Pridgen said, all boats must rise, and he's right. And what, what he means by that and what we mean by that is the per capita money income level needs to rise for all. Persons below poverty level, that needs to decrease. Home owner ownership rate, that needs to increase. High school graduation rates, that needs to increase. 
unemployment rate, which we're doing better uh, here in Buffalo and Erie County, Western New York. We need to continue to do better to give everybody an opportunity to be able to work and to be able to provide uh, for their families. Now, Mark, you mentioned that the Popular Annual Financial Report, or PAFR as it's known, this is yeah. a report compiled by your office. And in addition to the demographic uh, information that's in that, there's also a great deal of information about economic development, business activity, and information about the city government in, and the city finances in this report. Now, I'm proud to announce in this show that your PAFR, your public or your popular annual financial report just recently won the highest award given by the Government Finance Officers Association. This is a gov uh, organization of municipal government finance analysts and, and, and officers that actually awarded your PAFR the yeah. Certificate of Outstanding Achievement, the highest award given to this PAFR. And, and although the PAFR isn't a required report, it's one of a, it's an optional report that really only a handful of municipalities across right. the country do. Yeah, this yeah. is your second one. The first one won the same award, and this was a very uh, esteemed award coming from this organization that uh, specializes in government finance. We're, uh, we're very, very proud of it uh, for several different reasons. Uh, the GFOA, as you, as you mentioned, uh, they are an international organization uh, and uh, certainly across our nation, and uh, they are a very, very important organization here in New York State. And for them to give our employees an award uh, for us communicating properly to our citizens and giving them the information that they need and deserve uh, is absolutely outstanding. So I, wa I want to thank uh, First Deputy uh, Ann Forty Sherino and our city accountant Bill Ferguson and also uh, Patrick Curry, uh, who is a tremendous writer and who has been instrumental in, in making sure that this uh, PAFR uh, is something that people can understand. But more importantly, uh, when we get recognition uh, from the GFOA, that is a good thing for Buffalo and we're proud of it. Now, I would like to point out to the viewers at home that they can obtain the PAFR. They can get an electronic version anytime on our website, www.city-buffalo.com slash controller, or they can just call our office at 716-851-5255 and ask for a copy of the PAFR. We'll mail them one out to it or however many copies sure, they want. Absolutely. Or then they come by the 12th floor of City Hall and pick up some copies of the PAFR, but they're always available in our office, and we can send them out to anyone who's interested. Again, that number is 716-851-5255. Uh, now, Mark, we've talked about the Government Finance Officers Association, GFOA, as they're called. Yeah. Now, recently, they wanted you to speak at a conference, and this isn't about the PAFR. This is about an uh, innovative investment program that you started. Now, you've done this about a half dozen times right. where you're actually – loaning money, not you personally, the city of Buffalo is loaning money to the school districts around the state, especially ones close to Buffalo. West Seneca was one of them. Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls. And it's it's an example of cooperation in government where y the city gets a better rate on its investments that they would have from a bank, yeah. sometimes up to tenfold. And meanwhile, the school district that needs this money to be loaned to them gets a better rate than any bank would give them. So it's a win-win. Absolutely. Win-win. A proposition, and and it's two governments working together collaboratively without needing two other banks involved, and yeah. working together to solve each other's problems. And the government finance officers are so impressed by this program, and 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 Buffalo is really the only municipality out there on the lending side that's doing yep. this. So they wanted to get your advice, and your advice, and, and the advice of. Uh, your financial advisor, Rick Gansey from Capital Markets, right. and give a presentation to all the other government officers across the state about this exciting program and how it's really changing the way the city invests and it's changing the way that, that we work with other uh, governments and other municipal uh, school districts and yeah. make it a win-win situation for both So sides. it's something that we're very, very proud of. It has been on my mind uh, since I became the controller four years ago. And as you know, Patrick, and, and the citizens know, because I've mentioned this before, 
before I'm an amateur historian, and I did go through a lot of different reports, and I figured out that there was a controller in the 1950s, uh, Chester Cole, who had the same thing on his mind, uh, idle funds. Idle funds are not really going to bring in any revenue if they're just sitting idly. <laughs> That's the whole point of it, right? And so the, the banks right now, although they're trying to be helpful, uh, the basis points uh, that we're getting uh, are, is very, very low painfully low. And so exactly the way that you've described it, uh, we've done what Dr. Stephen Covey, uh, who created the book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, we have figured out the habit that says win-win. It's a win for the city of Buffalo, first and foremost. If this wasn't a win, for the city of Buffalo, and quite frankly, in all due respect to West Seneca and Niagara Falls and the other places, we would not be doing this. This is a benefit to the citizens of Buffalo. And at the end of the day, we've done six deals, and we've brought in $226,000 to the bottom line of Buffalo. If we didn't do anything, we just sat there, sound asleep and do nothing, we would only yield about $24,000. So we are doing good work, and if we can be helpful to a school district who are educating young people along the way, perfect. But the number one reason to why we're doing it is to benefit the citizens of Buffalo, and we're trying to figure out revenue streams to come in to Buffalo, and that's what we're doing, and we've been very successful at it, and we're proud of it. Now, it's very important to note that these are very risk-free investments. Now, there's two reasons why. One is they're thoroughly vetted by the Office of the State Controller to make right. sure they're safe and there's no risk. And the second reason it's they're so risk-free is that there's an intercept function. Yeah. So say a school district um, couldn't pay, you would in, the city of Buffalo would intercept those funds right from the state so they would get their state aid directly from the New York, uh, New York State rather than waiting on the district to pay them back. But that hasn't, ha hasn't come to that yet. You don't expect it to come no, to that ever. No, no. But there are s certain protections in play for Buffalo that, that make this a uh, not only a win-win, but also a risk-free investment. Yeah, and, and, and again, being an amateur historian, that was actually put into place, this intercept, by Arthur Levitt, who was the longest, who was the longest serving state controller, uh, who served over 24 years and is known as one of the greatest controllers ever uh, in, in our nation, who came from New York State. Uh, I believe that because of the guidance that we've been getting from Tom DiNapoli, uh, that he will be known as one of the greatest controllers ever to serve in our state, because when he gives us guidance and, he, and we're able to figure out how to do these things that are beneficial to the city of Buffalo, that's what it's all about. And so we, we give uh, the state controller uh, a lot of credit, but quite frankly, you said it earlier, we are the only municipality in this state to ever execute this, and we've done it well, uh, and, uh, and I know the citizens of Buffalo are proud of us. Now, after this conference, you had many other municipalities that are interested in this program from both ends of it. Yeah, I, it, was, uh, it was interesting. Uh, they didn't ask me for my autograph or anything, but they did want information. And it's one of the things that Ann Forty Sherino and I talked about four years ago when we first took over the Comptroller's office. We said, uh, not only do we want to do an initiatives that are important uh, for Buffalo, but we would like to teach and train others if they're interested. And we've done that in City Hall beyond the 12th floor that I that I that we that we uh, watch over, uh, and we've done it with some of the different entities within Buffalo. And now we're doing it with municipalities across the state who are calling us and asking us, uh, you know, particular questions on how they would do it. And so we simply are just going to make observations and let them know how we've done it. And uh, and any anybody we can help, uh, we will. And that's that's what we do. Now, changing from a presentation you gave, you actually have a lecture series that you put on for City Hall employees. Yeah. The most recent guest of your lecture series is Voice of the Buffalo Bills, John Murphy. You gotta what, love John Murphy. He's what okay. better time to do it than the start of Buffalo Bills training camp? And, yeah. and John was great, and your employees were, were thrilled to have him there. In fact, you had to change the venue to <laughs> accommodate all the employees that wanted to check out yeah. John's talk. Yeah, 
We, we're, um, we're just very excited about this. We, we did this, we've started this this year in every quarter. Uh, we try to invite a speaker that we feel that our employees are really gonna get some value f out of their own personal life and also in terms of what they do each and every day for the city of Buffalo. And so the first one we, we had, the Franklin Covey, which is the seven habits of highly successful people. And then the second one we had Gary Keith, who is a known economist uh, for M&T Bank. And then the great John Murphy comes in and with that big smile on his face, and he's probably one of the most knowledgeable people you ever want to meet. And some of our employees were trying to catch him, you know, with a trivia question here or there. And there's just no way you're going to catch him. He, this is his life. Sports in Buffalo uh, is his life. And he has been a friend of mine for some time. His father served in the New York State Assembly with one of my predecessors, uh, Assemblyman Dick Kane. Uh, his wife is a dear friend of mine, and she served uh, as the supervisor of Orchard Park. Uh, and so the Murphys serve this community. And right now, I have never seen the Buffalo fans, you know, since the Super Bowl days, they're, they're worked up. And when John Murphy came into our floor and gave his uh, presentation, it, there was a lot of people with big, big smiles on their faces. And, and so let's just hope that they, they have a very successful training camp. And then before you know it, uh, the season will begin. Will begin and, and I hope the Bills are, are back on the playoff program. Now John was kind enough to sit down with Controller's Corner for a brief interview. Stay tuned for this Controller's Corner interview. I'm here in the Comptroller's office in City Hall with legendary broadcaster and voice of the Buffalo Bills, John Murphy, who's the latest speaker in the Comptroller Shorter's lecture series. Now, John, what did you talk about with the employees in City Hall today? First of all, I'm a little afraid when you refer to me as legendary. That To me, that denotes age, <laughs> and I guess I am, uh, I've been around a while. But, you know, we talked about the Bills. There's a lot of excitement about the 2015 Buffalo Bills season, and uh, understandably so. The Bills had a pretty good year last year with nine wins and uh, have one of the best defenses in the NFL, and they've added probably the most flamboyant coach in the NFL in Rex Ryan. So people are pumped up. We're approaching training camp time, and it's, it's good to be around fans who are excited about the upcoming season. That's what we focus on. Now, John, you're mostly known for sports and broadcasting. You were the news anchor, or sports director and sports anchor at two local stations. You're obviously the voice of the Bills. You host a radio show. But being here in City Hall, you're no stranger to government. Your father was an assemblyman who passed legislation initiating yeah. the I Love New York right. program. Your brother is a judge in Niagara County. And your wife, who is also a broadcaster along with you, was Orchard Park Town Supervisor. How important is public service? And is there any chance you'll run for office someday? No chance. Let me get that out of the way right away But because uh, I love what I do. But, yeah, I mean, I grew up around that. You know, my grandfather actually was Niagara County Democratic Party chairman for decades back in the era of, uh, of uh, Franklin Roosevelt and, um, and, and those days back in the 30s and 40s when Franklin Roosevelt in, in the, the 20s really was governor of New York State. And um, so my dad grew up around it, and he... Uh, uh, about midway through his life was approached to run for New York State Assemblyman and he ran and, and served for uh, I think 18 years and loved the, the life and loved the the public service aspect of it in Albany and as you mentioned my brother Matt is now a Niagara County Court Judge he was a uh, the district attorney in Niagara County for 16 years I believe the longest tenured district attorney in Niagara County history so yeah campaigns and politics are a part of our family Mary had a great four-year run as supervisor in the town of Orchard Park and decided not to run for re-election and um, I mean, I help out where I can, but there is absolutely no chance that I'll be running for office. None. Now, we just lost legendary broadcaster Van Miller recently. Uh, you had the opportunity not only to work alongside with Van as a color analyst when he was the play-by-play -play announcer for the Bills, but you also succeeded Van as the play-by-play -play announcer. What was it like to work with him, and what was it like to follow in his footsteps? Yeah, it was great to work with him. We had a 16-year uh, partnership together. He was play-by-play, -play and I was a color analyst, and we had just a wonderful time, and I learned so much from him about broadcasting, and we became pretty good friends, uh, really good friends, as a matter of fact, and um, to succeed him in that job was intimidating. Uh, I mean, the man's in five halls of fame, you know, including an honor from the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And so that uh, set you back a little bit. And I learned early on not to compare my work as a play-by-play -play guy, which I'm going into my 12th season now, not to compare my work to his because there's no way I'd be able to measure up or sleep at night for that matter. But, uh, you know, it was great. On a professional level, he was a great mentor and a great instructor on in how to do it right. And on a personal level, he was a very, very good friend. So he's going to be missed. 
Now back to the Bills. Rex Ryan, as you mentioned, was hired. How has he changed the culture, and how will that translate on the field? That the second part of your question is the interesting part, which I do not have the answer to, but he's changed the culture a great deal in terms of uh, uh, I, I believe the players feel freer and looser and uh, more able to to uh, show their talent on a regular basis. Uh, there was sort of a tightness around the Doug Marone era that Rex Ryan has lifted, and, and that's his style. That's Rex Ryan's style, you know, to let the players play and let the players have fun. He, you know, he took a couple of days out of mini camps and OTAs to go on like team bonding trips. And um, it seems to me the players responded well to that. All of it doesn't matter if you don't win, you know, and there's as one Bill's longtime scout used to say to me over and over again, there's a million different ways to skin the cat, you know, and there is in the NFL. Uh, so this is the approach they're, they're trying now. I think it'll, it'll bear fruit. I think there's a, a ton of talent on the Buffalo roster that uh, doesn't need, you know, unnecessary tightness. I think they'll respond well to Rex Ryan's style. Thanks for joining us in Controller's Corner, John, and thanks for talking to My the pleasure. employees today. Thanks. Yes, it should be an exciting year for the Buffalo Bills. We're all hoping that Rex Ryan will really change the culture of this team and bring us back to our winning ways. So part of this presentation you had with uh, John Murphy was also with the employees is you gave your Rowan Award. Now yeah. this is an award that's given quarterly to the employees that go above and beyond uh, in your department and get that special recognition. And it's named after uh, a book that is, is very special to you. And the, the key of the book is the initiative is doing the right thing without do, being yeah. told. Now, the, the winner of this quarter's Rowan Award was Joanne Eddy, a very hardworking employee that's uh, been in your department, has been in the city of Buffalo for years. And, and her contributions are just invaluable to what you do. Yeah, there's no question about it. And, and so we, we were able to give the award uh, that day when John Murphy was there, which which is a nice thing to do. And uh, and just one, one last thought, Patrick, I just want to make sure nobody in the controller's office, especially you, think that I'm going to jump out of an airplane <laughs> like our coach, because I'm not, <laughs> I'm not doing it. Uh, but going, going back to the, uh, to the Rowan Award, uh, it is something that we started four years ago, and we try to identify those people uh, who are just going way above the call of duty. And, uh, and so we, we have been doing this every quarter for the last four years, and Joanne Eddy, uh, was the person that we identified uh, and we gave her the Rowan Award during the ceremony uh, of during the presentation of, of John Murphy and it's exactly that initiative is doing the right thing without being told and there are certain things um, that everybody knows it's in her job scope and she does it and then there's some other things that she just goes above the call of duty and all of our employees do that pretty much on a daily basis but what we do is try to recognize uh, them for doing it and encourage others to do the same and we give them the book, the, the Message to Garcia, which was written in 1898 by Albert Hubbard. Uh, and so it is something that's important. We, we have a big uh, plaque uh, that's in our conference room with all of the award winners from the last four years. And it's just, and, and at that time, I also give an overview of what's going on. Uh, all, all of the things that we talk about in the Controller's Corner, I actually talk to our employees about uh, during the Rowan Award. So it's a communication opportunity and a way to give an award. And plus we have you know coffee and pastries and juice and fruit and all of those things too. So it's, it's a good team building opportunity and something that we're proud of. Now you just want to give an update to the viewers at home about the Audit of the city's streetlights and electricity bills. Now, yeah. you, you have a team, you, you hired some outside help who uh, is looking at and went to every single one of the streetlights in the city to do an inventory, and their name is Troy and Banks, and the best part is they only get paid if the city gets paid. They make a portion of any refund the city receives, yeah. so this doesn't cost the city a dime to do this right. audit. Yeah. So what they've already found, they've, they, they've submitted about 17, 18 claims to National Grid, but one in particular, uh, is is totally undisputed is that the city was overcharged for luminaires. Now the the bill for that it turns out that with interest the cities do a refund of roughly a million dollars, and that's just one of the 17 claims. A and you're working with National Grid to try to get that refund to the city taxpayers as soon as possible. Yeah. Because since we did not pay, since we paid for these lights that didn't exist, sure. yeah. the city deserves uh, the money back, and, and and electricity is one of the costliest. Uh, non-personnel items for the city, roughly $16 million yeah, a no, year. no question so about it. So this is part of your annual audit plan and your overall audit uh, 
your overall audit strategy that says that you're going to be looking at places where we're spending a lot of money or we're, we're receiving revenue that we should be receiving more. And, and this in particular is where, we're, where our expenditures are higher than they should be. And, and that goes along with your audit plan uh, of watching these revenues and watching these expenditures and make sure the city isn't paying one more dime than they should. Yeah. So the, the citizens, Patrick, of Buffalo are very smart and they probably are saying to themselves, boy, oh boy, you two guys talk about this an awful lot. And you would be right, citizens of Buffalo, because this is probably one of the longest, most arduous audits we've ever done. Uh, and we do have some outside expertise helping us. It's not easy to do. And this has been probably about a two year process when it, when it finally uh, culminates and comes together and the citizens are gonna get the revenue uh, that we deserve, but it is a process. Uh, and so we're working at it and we will continue to work at it uh, you know, each and every day. Now, Mark, you've had a really busy summer. Yeah. In addition to several parades around the city that you marched in, you also went to the Mass and Jazz Fest and uh, the Pine Grill Jazz Fest yeah. uh, in Martin Luther King Park. And there's a great deal of uh, events across the city, including National Line Out, that you're going to be attending. Yeah. Um, so tell us a little bit about your summer and all the different festivals yeah. and parades and programs across the city that you've been enjoying. Well, I will tell you, I, this probably happens in all communities, but especially here in Buffalo uh, with spring, summer, there are so many different things to do. And so, as you know, Patrick, I make it a point to go to every single neighborhood in the city of Buffalo. And so I go east, west, north, and south. And so there's probably a farmer's market in every section, north, south, east, and west. Uh, there are parades, as you mentioned. Uh, Martin Luther King Park is a beautiful Olmstead Park, and in the summertime, uh, it is a lot of fun to be there, especially uh, if you like the blues and if you like jazz. Uh, and so the Pine Street Grill uh, event was just recent, and it's, uh, it was unbelievable. And thousands and thousands and thousands of people uh, at Martin Luther King Park uh, and so it's a wonderful event. They honored Pappy Martin, uh, who is probably one of the greatest musicians and more importantly than being a musician, one of the greatest teachers of our young people in music. Uh, and so they, uh, they honored him. And so uh, Peg Overdorf uh, over on the south side, she has the Riverfest Park every Wednesday night. She's got a concert going on. Uh, Mary Hennigan in, in, uh, on Abbott Road at the Irish Center, she's got Under the Tent. Why do they do it? And there's one reason, one reason only. They're trying to raise revenue to keep the tradition alive, no matter what it is. Uh, so the, the Pine Street Grill is to keep the African uh, Museum and all of the different things that they have, cultural uh, uh, events going on. The, the South Buffalo Irish Center, they're doing it to keep Irish music, Irish language. Uh, Peg Overdorf does these events so that um, she can have the best pristine most beautiful park uh, for the citizens of Buffalo. This, these are all public events. Uh, and so I'm, I'm very, very proud of everybody in Buffalo and all of the different neighborhoods who reach out and who do things to promote Buffalo. It is just fascinating and it's a beautiful summer and I'm looking forward to continue going to these events. Well, Mark, that's all the time we have in the special hour long Controller's Corner. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Patrick. And thanks for joining us at home. Make sure to check out the City Controller's website at city-buffalo.com slash controller, our YouTube channel where you can watch all the special reports we showed you today, our Facebook page, our Twitter handle. Thanks for joining us in Controller's Corner. On behalf of Controller Mark Schroeder, this is Pat Curry signing off. Go Bills. Hmm.